joining us this morning. Um, it's been a couple of months since I was here with you and I want to thank God for having you join me. We have the early birds. I want to welcome Sister Anne-Marie Florentville. When I was testing this morning at seven o'clock she was on. Sister Florentville, welcome. Sister Brenda Samuel, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Sister Thea Charles from out there in Texas, welcome. Sister Maggie Agdoma from Swazelle, St. Lucia. Welcome. And my beloved brother and friend, Brother Malcolm Emilia and Sister Sadia. Welcome. Welcome. Those are the names I was able to get. Um, it's just me, so I'm unable to view and do this at the same time. So um, hopefully I'll be able to get a few more names by the end so I can give you a blessed Sabbath wish. I really want to thank you guys for coming this morning. And I thank God for keeping us all um, while we were absent one from, one from another. I want to give God thanks and praise for his love and his goodness towards us. We are not deserving, but God is faithful when we are not. And so I just give him thanks and praise. I just want to say uh, to Brother Bill Mortley down there in St. Lucia, thank you and your friend for making uh, the, the, the banner free of charge for us. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And there are others who have supported us to ensure that we got back on air and we give God thanks and praise for you and we thank you. Um, this morning, <clears throat> we are starting over. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, the natural inclination is to quit and decide, ah, let me go do something else. But when God has called you for a particular purpose, and he has buried it in your spirit. It doesn't matter what obstacles you face. Uh, chances are, God has promised he will give you the strength to move forward. So I have made it uh, my mantra that no matter what transpires, I will not loosen or turn back. I will not take my hand off the plow. I will not quit. I will continue as God directs me so that I can see his face one day. And I want to say to you that may you also do the same. I want to give you a couple of announcements. Today, we started at with Mrs. June at 8 o'clock. We'll be done between 9.30 and 10. Um, and then on tomorrow morning, we'll be back at 9 o'clock for our evangelistic service. And tomorrow's topic is entitled the tale of two disciples. The tale of two disciples. Join us then for that sermon. Invite a friend. Uh, brethren, we're living in the last days. So many things are happening. People are concerned about this and about that. And uh, we are uncertain of what tomorrow holds. 
The only certainty we have is Jesus. Invite a friend uh, to this service. Invite a friend to the 10 o'clock service that Brother Malcolm is having uh, in a couple hours because the gospel has been preached there too. And uh, in, in, in invite them out on, 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 on Sunday at 9 o'clock and again on Sunday evening at 7.30 um, with Brother Malcolm's Sunday night quench. And um, uh, on Tuesday, on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, I'll be here with um, Evangelism 101. I got a question from Brother Burn Bully. Brother Burn Bully in Atlanta, Georgia. And we are going to answer that question on Tuesday night. He wants to know what happens to the soul of man when he dies. What happens to the soul when he dies? I also got a question from a young lady uh, also in Atlanta, Georgia. Her name slips me now. Um, Sharika, Sister Sharika Bini, wanted to know um, if she could use her religion uh, at work uh, to sidestep taking the vaccine. So I'm going to deal with those two questions on Tuesday night. So invite a friend and come join us then. Okay? So we have today at 8 o'clock and tomorrow at 9 o'clock from 9 to 10.30 tomorrow morning and on Tuesday from 8 to 9. I need to let you know my friend Brother Malcolm you know, um, is also streaming. He will be on at 10 o'clock this morning and he will be on again uh, on to tomorrow night at 7.30 and then on Thursday at 8 o'clock. Uh, we are brothers in Christ. We spread the gospel of salvation and we will support each other. God works in mysterious ways. It's wonders to perform. So the gospel can be spread. Sometimes he separates his brothers, his children, so that his word can get far and wide. And we give him thanks and praise for that. I want to welcome those of you who are just coming in. Like I said, I can't tell. I can't see. So you have to bear with me. It's just me doing this today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I want to um, pray at this time for uh, the, my church family, uh, the church that I worshipped at before. Uh, I went to England last year, one way I served, um, the River of Life church family. We lost uh, one of our elders, Elder Rhonda Hazel, will be funeralized tomorrow. And um, I know the church is at morning, and I know her family is at morning. So I want to lift them up in prayer today. So um, before we get into the word of God, let us bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, King of the universe, the creator of all things, the redeemer of every one of us who have decided that we are going to follow you, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for your love and your tender kindness towards us. Lord, we are not deserving because in our human nature, all we can do is rebel against you. But you, who have loved us with an everlasting love, seek us and find us. And you put your spirit in us so that we can have a desire to want to follow you. And we thank you, Lord, because uh, if it weren't for that, destruction, sudden destruction would be. We thank you, Lord, for the break that you enabled us to have for the time we were able to spend with you in prayer, in fasting, in supplication, in, 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 in meditation, in, in, in looking back at, 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 at all that transpired and how we could come back and do things better under the auspices of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you will direct us as we move forward. May this be done only for your name, only for your glory, only for your praise. May I, Lord, always decrease and may, me, may I remember that I am just an unprofitable servant doing what is required of me. Help me, Lord, to take no glory or to take no accolades, but to give it all to you because you alone are worthy. I pray, Lord, that you would be with each viewer this morning as their faces differ so they Bless each person. Grant them your joy. Grant them your peace. Grant them your happiness. Grant them, Lord, all that they stand in need of. Help them not to focus on things below, but on things above. And I promise, Lord, that you're selling your word, things below will be abundant for us. I pray, Lord, for the River of Life Church, Church family. I pray, Lord, also for the family of Sister Rhonda Hazel. Lord, she went to sleep in you. And Lord, we commit her body 
to the ground tomorrow, but her spirit has returned to you. So Lord, help us not to grieve as those who uh, have no hope, because we have the blessed hope burning within our hearts. Be with each member of her family. Comfort them, Lord. Be with each member of her church family, the river of life family. I pray, Lord, that you reach out to them in love and comfort and help us, Lord, to understand that death is a transition in from this mortality to the immortality that you've promised us. So as she rests in the grave, Lord, may we who are alive and remain stay faithful so on that great getting up morning we shall all be reunited. I pray, Lord, that you would be with me now as I present your word. I pray that I may submit my brain, my tongue, my mouth, my hands, my feet, my entire being to your spirit. May he possess this body temple from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. Leave, Lord, leave no room for any foreign foul entity or spirit. And you, Lord, do this. I submit and I surrender. Use this vessel for your name, your honor, and your glory. And for the salvation of me, the one who is uh, uh, you are using to do that, I pray. And for the salvation of all our listeners and viewers. I pray, Lord, that everything will work smoothly, that the equipment will work on this end and on the end for everybody else, so that you can share your word without any incident. Bless us, Lord, and keep us. And when you come, save us all we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Starting over. Starting over. You know, um, when I was a young man, many, many years ago, uh, there was a popular song on the radio by a couple of guys, by Mel and Tim. And uh, the words go like this. I'll read one stanza and then we'll come back to it at the end. It says, starting all over again, it's going to be rough. So rough. But we're going to make it. Starting all over as friends. It's going to be rough on us. But we're going to make it. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 30, that we can do all things through Christ. Who gives us the strength and that includes starting over and today the 7th of august 2021 god has given us the wherewithal he has given us the strength he has given us uh, the ability he has given us the time to start over and so that brethren is what we're going to do we're going to go into the word of god and we are going to see how even god himself had to start over he had to start over to protect those he loved and to ensure that they have an, had an opportunity to make a decision for him. So turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 and we're going to read from verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that is upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said, let them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of, the tree, of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Verse 30, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. Verse 31, join me in reading verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Somebody say, very good. It wasn't just good, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God created. 
and he blessed. And when he was done, he looked and he said, it is very good. About 1,000, according to Bible scholars, 656 years later, things weren't very good anymore. Let's go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Because the Bible tells me that things got bad real quick. We know Adam and Eve sinned, and God kicked them out of the garden. And after that, things changed. Things were no longer very good. And the Bible tells us in uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, the daughters and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they looked, and they took them of all which, sorry, and they took them wise of all which they chose. Verse 3, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Why did God say that? For that he is also, that he also is flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. Adam lived to 930 years. Methuselah lived to 969 years. But God is saying because of the bad things that were taking place, because of the evilness of the world, I, by that time that he had to shorten man's lifespan to 120 years. Verse 4 says, and there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. I just want to say something here. People say, well, the sons of God were angels, and the daughters of men were people on earth. That's not true. That's not true. Angels are spirit beings. They're asexual. Angels can't have sex unless they possess a body that they can use to have sex with another body, all right? This here is referring to those who were following God, the children of Seth and stuff, as opposed to the children of Cain and, uh, and those who, who disobeyed God. So I want us to get that very clear, all right? There were no sexual interaction with angels and people, okay? So I'll make that clear, all right? So the Bible makes it very clear that problems began to arise. And verse five tells us and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his thoughts, of his heart, was only evil continually. Every thought, every imagination within the human mind, within the human heart, was evil and wicked continually. Can we fathom that? That's why Jesus says, as it were, in the days of Noah, if we look around us today, we see the world getting back there. And God will have to put a stop to this and start over. Oh my goodness. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowl of the air. For it had repented me that I have made them. God said. But God is love. God is not a destroyer. He's a creator. God is a lover. And he wants to bring his creation, fallen though it may be, back into harmony with himself. So God decides to start over and verse 8 says but hallelujah no found grace no found grace brethren how would how would i love to find grace in the eyes of the lord wouldn't you want to find grace in the eyes of the lord like noah did at a time when everybody was doing what they wanted to do what seemed right in their own eyes as if is today would God find grace in us so if he has to start over he could start over with us in fact I'm here to let you know brethren 
that he is ready, willing and able to start over with us. We just got to submit and allow him to. So, God is hurt because of the evil and the wickedness in the earth. But he finds grace. Noah finds grace with God. And so God decides he's going to start over. Verse 17 and 18 of Genesis chapter 6. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherewith is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee, Noah, will I establish my covenant. I will start over with you. I'm going to destroy everything. I'm going to wipe out everything with a flood, Noah. But I'm going to start over with you. I will establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wives and thy sons' wives with thee. So God says, I'm going to take the eight of you. I know your children are living right. I know their wives may not be living right. But Noah, as the priest of the home, I am going to honor you by saving your family, and I'm going to establish my covenant with you, and I'm going to start over. And the Bible tells me in Genesis chapter 7, 1 to 6, and God said unto Noah, come down and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. For every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by seven, the male and the female, and the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and the female, of the fowls also of the air by seven, the male and the female, to keep seed alive for the face of all the earth. God is setting things up, putting stuff in the ark, animals, seed, people, so that he can start over. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. So God protects Noah and his family. He protects some of the clean animals. He protects some of the unclean animals. He gets seed and grain, puts in the ark so he can start over, and then he washes everything away so he can start over. Oh, my dear brethren, we see God starting over after the wickedness of the antediluvians. It's an indication that God is patient. It's an indication that God is long-suffering. It's an indication that God is love. I want us to get that. Sometimes in his love for us, he has to allow certain bad things to happen so he can get our attention, so we can surrender fully and completely to him, so he can grant us the beautiful, abundant life that Jesus died to provide for us. So we see that God starts over with Noah. Let's look at another example of God starting over with his church. With his church. In the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus. When we go to Exodus chapter 19. God establishes his church. God establishes his church. And there it tells us in Exodus chapter 19 that God speaks to Moses. Calls Moses up and he speaks to Moses. The Bible says in verse 3, And Moses went up unto the Lord. And the Lord and unto God, and the Lord called upon him, unto him, sorry, out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. He was establishing a covenant with the house of Jacob, the children of Israel. They were going to be his church. All right? And the Bible says, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And how I bear you on eagles with and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. 
for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. I need you to go and tell people about my love. That's what the church is supposed to do. That is why he established it then. All right? And to be a holy nation, we are supposed to set an example for the rest of the world to see. That's what God established back there with Moses and the children of Israel at Sinai. And Moses came and called the elders of the people, verse 7, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered, hear this now, and said, all that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So there was a covenant, an agreement between God and the people, between God and his church. They had agreed that they were going to do what God said so they could be a royal priesthood and they would be a holy nation. They would tell the rest of the world of the goodness of God, the love of God. They would express it and God would bless them so that the people could see it and be convicted and convinced so that they too could be saved. But we understand that after God established this church, and then he came in Exodus 20 and he spoke to them or preached the first sermon to them. And that sermon can be found in Exodus 21 to 17. The people say, again, in Exodus 24, verse 3, everything the Lord has said to do, we will do. So the deal is ratified. Hear me now, the deal is ratified. Everything the Lord has said to do, we will do. That's what they say. But we come to realize but after that, they went their own way. Jesus says, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Isaiah says, in Isaiah 53, verse 6, um, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each man has gone his own way. Everybody, like we say in St. Lucia, to moon, everybody, one gone to homosexuality, one gone to lying, one gone to stealing, one gone to gossiping, one gone to illicit sexual behavior. One gone to murder. Everybody finding what seems right to them and doing it, although it is not right in the sight of God. All had sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so God in his love and his mercy looked down and realized that these people were incapable. Incapable of doing what he said because they were doing it in the flesh and the flesh cannot please God. We feed the flesh, we dress up the flesh, we promote the flesh, we make flesh comfortable, but flesh cannot help us in any way when it comes to our spiritual and our eternal destiny. I want us to get that. So there must be a starting over, there must be a making over and that's what God had to do. Because we see, after that promise made in Exodus 24, verse 3, and in Exodus 19, verse 8, by the people, saying they were going to be obedient to God, do exactly what he said, we see centuries of apostasy. We see centuries of idol worship. We see centuries of misbehavior. We see centuries of wickedness and evil being perpetuated by the children of Israel, the church of the living God. And that took place because they looked around them and they saw the other nations and wanted to be like them. They looked around. Oh, brethren, we didn't stop looking around at the Joneses. We didn't stop looking around at our neighbors and our friends and look unto Jesus. He is the author. He is the finisher. He is the sustainer of our faith. Look up. Look up. Your redemption draws nigh. It comes from above. Don't look around. Don't look around. When you look around, you lose focus. And that's what happened to the children of Israel. So what, does, what, what happens in 1 Samuel? Let's go to 1 Samuel. I want us to understand what happened to that first church. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we see the people murmuring to the judge and the prophet Samuel. 
1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8, and it says, And it came to pass when Samuel, we read in verse 1, was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abia. And they were judges in Bathsheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after money or lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Oh my goodness, the church was in full-blown apostasy. Those who were supposed to be leading out in church were doing what was wrong. And so it says here in verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel at Ramah. The elders had taken their eyes of God also. The leaders had taken their eyes of God. And I dare say even Samuel is his raising of his sons and his uh, 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 dealing with them had faltered because they were doing everything that was wrong. Although Samuel was a righteous judge, although Simon, Samuel was the prophet of the living God, but his children did not follow his footsteps. And it caused the elders to become concerned. But had the elders kept their eyes on Jesus, had they kept their eyes on God, had they kept their eyes on their creator, had they kept their eyes on their redeemer from Egypt, had they kept their eyes on him, then his spirit would have been able to help them understand that he's still there, he's still in charge, and he would take care of it. But that's not what happened. The Bible says in verse 5, and they said unto Samuel, those elders did, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Give us a king. They had a king. His name was Jesus. They had a Lord. He was God Almighty. He had taken them from Egypt. He had shown them many wonderful works. They had heard, uh, they had seen the mountain shake. They had seen the fire. They had heard uh, the noise from the earthquake when God spoke. And it caused them to shut up. But they had forgotten. Haven't I said to you on more than one occasion that our brains on sin has built in forget us for what God does for us and who God is to us. I've said that over and over. And we see the children of Israel forgetting who God was, his power, and his ability to make wrongs right. So they went for a king because they were looking around and everybody else had one. And so they rejected God. The Bible says in verse 6, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people. Give them what they want. God never tries to usurp the power of choice. It's unfortunate when human beings under the unction of the devil tries to control other people and dictate what they do. The God who created people don't do that. And so, we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't do it. We should never try to control another person. We can advise. We can set examples. But never try to usurp their power and control and get them to do what we want. That's satanic. Even God, when the people rejected him, gave them what they wanted. He says, How can the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee? For they have not rejected you, Samuel. They have rejected me that I should not reign over them. They don't want me to be their king. They don't want me to be their Lord. They don't want me to govern them. They want somebody else. So let's give them what they want. And so things went from bad to worse because God was no longer their recognized king. Saul became their recognized king. And then David, and then Solomon, and then down through the ages, we saw king after king prophet after prophet, priest after priest, mess up and lead the children of Israel into abject apostasy. Year after year, God had to punish them, and then he had to deliver them, and he had to cause them to get punished again, and then he had to deliver them over and over and over and over again. Down in the days of Jeremiah, things were really bad. That's why Jeremiah is considered the weeping prophet. He cried for Israel. He cried. He carried a heavy burden. 
because of the sins of the church. And God, whose plan before the foundation of the earth was to save his church, had made a decision that he didn't care how bad it got, he was going to save his people from their sins. The Bible tells us that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what does he do? He sends his Son. He sends his Son. After hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of apostasy, the Bible tells me in Matthew 1, 21, that the woman brought forth a son. The woman here is not just Mary, but the church. He came from the bowels of the Jewish church. He brought, she brought forth a son. His name was called Emmanuel, God with us, because he came to save us from our sins and our iniquities. And the Bible tells us that when he came, they had the oracles. They had the books of the prophets. They had everything there. They knew he was coming, but because of their apostasy, they could not see spiritually. So they missed him. But I'm here to let you know that there were those among them, the least of these, who recognized him. Yes, the first believers of Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, were Israelites. Andrew, Peter, James, John, Philip, Nathaniel, they recognized him because they had been studying. The church didn't recognize them, but they recognized Christ, and Christ recognized them because he called them. That is found in John chapter 1, 40 to 49. Write it down, go read it. The first to believe on Jesus Christ were Jews. People from the powers of the church that God had set up at Sinai. And Jesus very, very subtly began to use them to start over. Somebody need to say praise the Lord. When you look in the Gospels, we also hear and see Jesus speak about building his church. Building his church. Now we know he wasn't talking about the Jewish church because the Jewish church rejected him. In Matthew 16, 18, he says, let's turn to it with me. Let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to read verse 18. And it says, Jesus speaking, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will build. All right? He said, I'm getting ready to do something new. I'm starting over. I established the church at Sinai with Moses and the children of Israel with the house of Jacob and they rejected me. But I'm not aware of you. I'm going to start over. I'm going to start over with you, Peter. I'm going to start over with you, Andrew. I'm going to start over with you, James. I must start over with you, John. I must start over with you, Philip. I must start over with you, Nathaniel. I must start over with you, Brother Malcolm. I must start over with you, Sister uh, Sadia. I must start over with you, Sister Thea. I must start over with you, Sister and the restoring bill. I will start over with you, Brother Leon Lloyd. I will start over with you, Brother Silver Calendar. I will start over with you. I will start over. We see the growing hostility between the Jewish church leaders and Jesus and the hostility perpetuated against his apostles once he had died and gone back to heaven. He was resurrected and gone back to heaven. We saw that the church was the vehicle used by Satan to attack the new thing that God had created through his son, Jesus Christ. And so we had Jesus speaking of destroying the tenants of the vineyard and giving it to others. Ah, brethren, I need you to hear and understand where we're going now. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Matthew. Turn with me in the book of Matthew. Starting all over again. Oh, yes, Jesus did. 
all God did at Noah's time. Jesus did in the New Testament at the time of Caiaphas and Annas, who were the leaders of the people at the church. And in verse 20, sorry, verse 21, verse 33, we see the Bible saying here, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruit of it. Wow. And the husbandman took another and, sorry, and the husband took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And when the Lord left therefore of the vineyard cometh, sorry, when the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? What will he do? <clears throat> They said unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his, vi his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits of their season. Jesus said unto them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builder rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and, and it is marvelous in your eyes. So Jesus is telling a story. He's using a parable to describe what has happened with the church. God uh, entrusted his church to leaders, earthly leaders, Samuel, Saul, David, Nathan, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, Isaiah, and, 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 and all the other kings, Solomon and Jehoshaphat and, 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 and Hezekiah. He, he entrusted it. But they didn't do what was right. And so, in the time of Matthew, when the Gospels began, he sent his son. And when his son came, those people who were supposed to be in charge took his son and they slew him. They wanted to maintain the status quo. Sometimes, brethren, we cannot allow the status quo to go. We've got to stop. We've got to step back. We've got to seek God's face. We've got to listen to his voice as he ministers to our spirit. And we've got to ask him to give us the strength by his spirit to be obedient to it so we can start over and give glory unto him. They killed the son. So, the question is asked. Is God done with the Jews? The ones who did that? Is he done with them? No. He's not. God has rejected no one. He never rejects anyone. The Jews rejected him. The Israelites, the house of Judah, the house of of, 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 of Israel, the house of Jacob, rejected God, but God loved them anyway. God never rejects. You have people say, well, God rejected the Jews because he was crucified by them. No, he didn't reject them. He just went elsewhere to get people that could come back and get them. He was starting over. He couldn't use them no more because they were too corrupted. So he went elsewhere. He went elsewhere. And that's how God dealt with that. Okay, so I want us to understand, brethren, that God is not one who will leave us. He will not reject us, but he will give us the opportunity 
again and again and again to start over. Starting all over again. It's going to be rough. But the love of God is with us. We are going to make it. He started over with the Christian church. In the book of Acts, the spread of the gospel to the Samaritans and the Gentiles led to even more conflict with the religious leaders of the Israelites of, of the Jewish church. So, you know, people would think that God rejected them, but no, he did not reject them. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 19 that he did not reject them. Luke chapter 19. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to read from 37 to 40. Luke chapter 19, and we're going to read from verse 37 to 40. And it says, And when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Hallelujah. Say, Blessed be that King that is come in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now the church was rejoicing and giving glory to Jesus and to God, who were both worthy. Check this out. The church leaders got a problem with it. And so, some of the Pharisees, from among the multitude, said unto Jesus, Master, rebuke his disciples. Stop these people from giving glory to you. Jesus answered and said unto them, I tell you that, if these should hold their peace, the stones would cry out immediately. So, listen, when we decide, we're going to let Satan have his way in our lives. God don't reject us. He just goes to the stone. Because if he could fashion you with a mouth and a tongue to praise him, he can do the same with a stone. And I dare say, those of us who are considered Gentiles are those stones. That is why I understand that it doesn't matter what wrong I do. It doesn't matter what people think about me. It doesn't matter what is said about me. I've got to continue to do what God has called me to do. It is by doing this and staying in the world that we are transformed. So God didn't reject. He's not going to reject you. I don't care what you did. He's not going to reject me in spite of all the wrongs I've done. He is not a rejecting God. He wants to receive us unto himself. And he wants to start over with us. And that's what God is saying here. All right? So, we've got to be clear that God rejects no one. He tells us in Ezekiel 18.4, all souls belong to him. So he can fashion any one of us to do his bidding when somebody else decides not to do it. Brethren, I want you to hear me clearly. I don't want the one of y'all to have to do the work that God left me to do. I want to make sure by his power, through his spirit, under the unction of the blood of Jesus and the word of my testimony, that I will hold on to the unchanging hand of God. I will keep my hand firmly on that plow and do what God requires of me to do until I close my eyes in death or he puts in his second appearing. Yeah. God rejects no one. You know, brethren, he started over with Noah in uh, the book of Genesis, and again with the with, with world, and then with the church, he started over in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, he started over with 120 people. It was not easy, but it was doable because the Spirit of God can make everything possible. There's nothing too hard for God to do. So the Bible tells us that Jesus charges them. Jesus charges them. And he leads them. And they're obedient to him. And then on the 50th day, or 10 days after his departure, 50 days after his crucifixion, or resurrection, the spirit comes. 
And they go out and they flip the then known world on its head because the power of the Spirit was driving them. And God began to start over. He started over. You know, um, here on the court, we're starting over. There have been many challenges, challenges that we didn't see coming. Some of them we're responsible for, and we take full responsibility. You know, this is what we call on the job training. You know, uh, you learn as you go, and God is your teacher sometimes. When you got a hard head like I do, sometimes you don't listen and you go and you do things your way and then you pay uh, the consequences. But God is love and God wants us to learn those lessons so that we will not repeat them. And I stand before you today to let you know that I have learned the lessons from the past year and a half since we established one accord and we began to come to you. I've learned some valuable lessons, some very painful lessons. One of the lessons I've learned is that I must forgive everybody. It don't care what anybody thinks about me. It doesn't care what anybody says about me. It doesn't care how anybody treats me. My responsibility as a representative of Jesus Christ, a preacher of the word, is to forgive and forget. And by forgetting, it doesn't mean that I eradicate it from my consciousness. It simply means that I move forward loving that person unconditionally, making sure that if they're in a situation where I can assist, I will, making sure that if there's a situation where I can help, I will, not bad talking them or doing things that will hurt them, but doing everything in my power to show them love. That's what Jesus requires. I had to learn that anew. I also learned to pray. For those who talk about me, say negative things, who lie on me. A lot have been said, brethren, a lot have been said. I've been called a pervert and all kinds of names. Even last Sabbath, I was preaching for Pastor um, Pastor Giles and somebody came into his, um, into his church, into his Zoom meeting and had some disparaging things to say. I know who did it and I got on my knees and I prayed for him. I prayed for his family. I prayed for the person who gave him the information because that's what God requires. God allows these things to happen, to prove us, to teach us. Then we look into our own lives and we see the mistakes we have made, where we have gone wrong, where we have stepped out of line and we admit and we take responsibility and we sit down and we ask God to repair and to revive and to redeem. And as he does so, we submit so that he can restore our soul. Brethren, that's what I have been doing. That's what I asked God to do with me. And he has done it. And so we start over today with a seriousness, understanding that the lives are the eternal destinies of so many people depend on this little ministry. I didn't start it, God did. And I want you to know, I wasn't aware of it, but when he did, he equipped me to do what he's placed me here to do. Just like he equipped Moses. When he called Moses out of Egypt into the wilderness of Midian, and he said to him, I got a job for you. Sometimes when God calls us to do a job, we start looking around. But he's talking to us. And I want to say to each and every one of us listening to me, when God calls you, he will equip you. He will equip you to do what he has called you to do. And when he equips you, just go forward with God confidence. I'm telling you something. What happens there is self-confidence begins to question it. Because self don't know how it's going to happen. But it's not up to self to make it happen. It's up to God. So back down, self, back down my will and let God's will be done. He who has started this great work in us will finish it. So my dear brethren, I beseech you, I call upon you to understand that this ministry is not about me. It's about you receiving God's word 
in purity, only from the Bible, not from anywhere else. The arm of flesh will fail us. We dare not trust our own. I ain't telling you don't read this book or read that. Don't go read. I'm not saying, but as you read, ask the Spirit to guide you into all truth. Let the Spirit be your guide and stay. Let the Spirit be your guide and stay. The Bible tells us in John 16, 13, it is the Spirit that will guide us into all truth. Not some scribe. The Spirit. So go read what the scribe says. But as you read, say, Spirit of God, enlighten me. Open my eyes that I might see your truths. And where there is error, help me to recognize it and leave it there. Brethren, your eternal destiny hangs on this. And that's why we are here. We know we will continue to get criticism. We know we will continue to, 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 to receive the hits. But God has promised us that he is with us and he will never forsake us. He said to us, they prosecuted the prophets before him. He came, not only they persecuted him, but they murdered him. So if we make our calling and election sure with him, the same thing is going to happen to us. So I pray to God today on your behalf and on my behalf that we will stand firm on the rock, Christ Jesus, face the foe without fear, having the shield of faith, having the sword of the spirit, and move boldly forward in spite of whatever hits we get. May we stand like Jesus did. May we stand like Paul did. May we stand like Peter did. May we stand like Matthew did. May we stand like Thomas did. May we stand like John uh, the Baptist did. May we stand like John the love disciple, the revelator did. May we stand like a brave with our face to the full. And it doesn't matter what Satan sends our way. We know and we have the blessed assurance that Jesus got us. He will protect us. He will keep us. And even if our lives are in danger, we will have no problem giving up our life for the cause of righteousness. Even in the same way, Jesus gave his life for us. Because he that shall save his life shall lose it. But he that shall lose his life for God's sake will find it. One day, one day, Tangale, Jesus is going to burst the other skies. And he's going to come down here. And he is going to say to those of us who were martyred, those of us who have died, those of us who are in the grave, arise, arise. Our names are going to be called and something miraculous will happen because this mortal, this dust will awaken into immortality. Those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet those who are coming from the graves together in the air to meet our Lord. I believe it. How about you? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? We've got to start over. We've lived our lives to please ourselves, doing what seems right in our eyes. Then Jesus came and he says, you've got to be born again. So that was the starting point. We started over when we were born again. We became babies in Christ. And so we nurse ourselves on the sincere milk of the word so we can grow in grace and in the full knowledge and understanding of God. And as we grow, we present it to others because by presenting it to others, it's, it's others, it's cemented in our own consciousness. Brethren, I want us to understand. That's how we stand over. We may be have been baptized already, so there's no need for a rebaptism because you're already born again. But what we can do is bow our heads and say, Lord, I submit to you. Start over with me. Start over with me, Lord. I may have faltered. I may have done things that I shouldn't have done, whether they are things I was aware of or whether they were things I was not aware of. It doesn't matter. Give it to God. Take responsibility for the wrongs you have done. I need to take responsibility for the wrongs I have done. And say to God, I yield, I surrender, forgive me, now cleanse me, make me 
whiter than snow by washing me in the blood. And Lord, as I start over, may I keep my eyes fixated on Jesus. May I turn my eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And may the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness towards us, for your love, for giving us another chance to stand over. Lord, we submit and we surrender to you today. We ask you, Lord, to start anew in us. Cleanse this temple. Eradicate every foul spirit. And may your spirit pick up habitation here and dwell here continually. I pray for each one of my brothers and sisters who are listening and viewing. Do the same for each and every one of us. May we come together as one. May we uh, ask, we ask you Lord, to take away the feelings of hurt, the feelings of, 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 of anger, the feelings of ill will, and bring us together as a unit. May we look out for each other and love each other. And where there is no love, may we give our love to the unloving person so they can receive love and one day return it. Bless us, Lord, and keep us. And may we continue to live for you and work for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Amen. And amen. We're going to start over. We're going to start over. <laughs> That was then. But this is now. But this is now. We're starting all over again. All over. Hallelujah. That was then. Oh, this is now. I'm starting all over again. That was then. This is now. Starting all over again. That was then, but this is now. I'm starting all over again. I'm starting all over. Yeah. 